So, I thought we'd have a look at the bones comprising the orbit. We were talking about the um, paranasal sinuses last week, and there are other videos about the bones of the skull and the foramen of the skull and that sort of thing, but I thought it was well worth looking at the orbit itself um, in a little bit of detail. We can talk about blowout fractures, so an interesting type of fracture that occurs here with a blow to the orbit, usually caused by some sort of you know, a sporting accident like a ball or a bat to the, to the orbit, um, which doesn't fracture in the way that you might expect. If you've watched the paranasal sinuses video, and we looked to see how thin some of the bones are around this area, then maybe you would expect these strange blowout fractures to fracture other bones than the bones at the front. We'll have a look at those. So we'll look at each bone in turn, we'll poke a pipe cleaner through the fissures and foramina and see where they go uh, and talk about blowout fractures, all right? So on our plastic skull here, if we look carefully, we can see the individual bones. Here's the frontal bone. Um, this is the maxilla here, and then we have the zygoma out here, so we're forming part of the zygomatic arch with the zygomatic bone here. Uh, we've got the sphenoid bone back in there, we've got the nasal bones here, we've got the lacrimal bone and the ethmoid bone, um, and you can maybe see a palatine bone in the back there. See all that? No, of course you don't, because it's all white. Um, if we have a look at our colourful skull, then we can see a little bit more. I mean, as I've said before, why are these bones the same colour so close to each other? Um, so watch out for that. But this big mustard bone here is the frontal bone. The nice purpley bone here is the maxilla. Uh, interestingly, we start off with left and right maxillae, so two separate bones. And then this, this fissure that you see here in you this is probably, this, this is more than likely, this is fused, right? We only ever talk about a single maxilla, uh, the two halves, because we're segmented animals and we form in two halves and stuff. The two halves meet and fuse here, giving us a single maxilla. Anyway, you can see how the maxilla is forming much of the floor of the orbit. If this bony cavity here is the orbit, there's the maxilla, and look, the frontal bone is forming much of the roof. Laterally then, this is also yellow. <laughs> it's a brighter yellow, right? Uh, <laughs> this is the zygomatic bone, or the zygoma. And the zygomatic arch is actually a complex of bones. So here, we've got the temporal bone, right? And this is contributing to the zygomatic arch, and this is the maxilla. This is also contributing to the zygomatic complex, but the zygoma, and the zy this is also known as the zygomatic bone, this is a separate thing. So the zygomatic arch is a complex of bones, the zygomatic bone is a bone. Make sense? Good. So look, the zygomatic bone is forming part of the lateral wall of the orbit, um, and then if we're talking about yellow bones, if we look inside, if we look in there, at the medial wall of the orbit, you can see another yellow bone. And that's the ethmoid bone. And the ethmoid bone is a really difficult bone to figure out conceptually where it is in your head. It's difficult to work out in your head where it is in your head. Um, but it's, 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 um, so it's, the ethmoid bone is a cuboidal, kind of, you know, think of a rectangular cuboid shaped bone um, forming the medial wall of the orbit and also contributing to the superior part of the nasal cavity, which as you can see in there. And also, the ethmoid bone is also here, look. So this is the frontal bone. Now this is the the anterior fossa within the cranial cavity. And this holy space here we call the cribriform plate. That's where we find the olfactory bulbs, 
the, the bulbs of cranial nerve one, the nerve responsible for olfaction, smell detection, sending through nerve fibers through those little holes to get into the nasal cavity. Does that help? So that's the ethmoid bone, right? So the ethmoid bone is there. It lets my nasal cavity, right? Middly, middly. You might need to spend some time looking at that one. And then we have at the back, <laughs> again, right? So at the back there, within the orbit, we've got the sphenoid bone in red. The sphenoid bone we can also see laterally here in red. And if we look in the back of the orbit, there's the sphenoid bone in red. Now there's another bone there, also in red, uh, which is, see this here? This is the hard palate. You can see the purple of the maxilla there, kind of, just about. I'll turn it over, get some light on it. It's, still, it's very dark. So the purple of the maxilla, and then you've got the red of the palatine bones, and those palatine bones also extend up into the orbit, just posterior to the maxilla. So we've got the red palatine bone next to the red sphenoid bone. There are more colours in the rainbow that could have been used. And then, have you noticed there's one more bone that we haven't talked about? It's the orange bone here. This is the lacrimal bone. So the lacrimal bone, lacrimation is tears, is forming tears, so the, the lacrimal gland is up here. And then tears wipe across, they run across your eye to drain here. So down here, we've got the nasolacrimal duct. And there's a little lacrimal sac as well here, collecting those tears. And the tears drain through the nasolacrimal duct into the nasal cavity. It actually opens in the uh, inferior meatus, right? In there. Anyway, so those are the bones of the orbit. Harder to see on the white skeleton, but we've got maxilla, lacrimal bone, ethmoid bone, frontal bone up here, zygomatic bone, sphenoid bone in the back, and then if you're really clever, the tip of the palatine bone in there. So those bones are forming the bony orbit. And inside that bony orbit then we've got the eye, obviously, but we've also got all of these extraocular muscles. Extraocular meaning that these are the muscles outside of the eye that are moving the eye around. Um, then we have nerves and blood vessels and that sort of thing. But the other thing that's in here is a whole load of fat, periorbital fat. There's a load of fat here packing the space. It's all nicely filling the orbit here, filling that bony orbit space. There's not a lot of space to be see here. Oh look, there's that lacrimal sac there that I was talking about. And there's the lacrimal duct and getting into the nasal cavity in there. So then on the skull, we can see some foramina, right? Some extra bits and bobs. So see this hole here? And then we've got what on this skull is a hole. Oh, look. <laughs> and sometimes it's just a notch. So you can see why sometimes there isn't that little bit of bone there. And it's just a notch. So this is the supraorbital notch, or in this case, maybe supraorbital foramen. And this would be the infraorbital foramen. Now look, see where that pipe cleaner comes out. All right, you see? So this is the infraorbital foramen. It's a bit of a canal. Uh, and again, this starts off as a groove and it gets covered over by the bone. So through here passes the infraorbital nerve and artery and vein. And through here passes the supraorbital nerve, artery and vein going up here. So these are branches of the trigeminal nerve, which are going to be carrying sensory information from up here and down here, right? Um, hmm, we should remember this nerve. We should, in fact, we, yeah, we should certainly remember this nerve later. Um, and then we can also see a perennial favourite. This is always nice. This is the optic canal. 
So that, that's passing through there. So that's the optic canal. It's a nice round tubular canal. Guess what goes through there? The optic nerve, cranial nerve two, and the artery within it supplying blood to the retina. Um, but we can see next to it, we can see these fissures, can't we? So there's the optic canal. And then next to it, we've got this fissure, haven't we? So this is the, the fissure then, that's the superior orbital fissure. And that's, look, that's connecting the middle cranial fossa with the bony orbit. So this, this is the way in which um, the, uh, the cranial nerves innervating the muscles of the orbit, the extraocular muscles, that's how they get in there. So basically that's how everything gets from the cranial cavity to the orbit that doesn't go through the optic canal. Everything else goes through the superior orbital fissure. And if there's a superior orbital fissure, then there must be an inferior orbital fissure. And that's it, can you see that? If that's the superior orbital fissure, then look, see that one down there? That, that is the inferior orbital fissure. And it is, it's another fissure but it's in the inferior part of the orbit. Now, if we stuck a pipe cleaner through there, where does that go? That's appearing in the deep face in there. So the, the inferior orbital fissure is linking the orbit with the deep face. And we see veins draining through there from the orbit into the facial vein. Somebody drilling over there and somebody lobbing stuff in a skip over there. It's a big hole he's drilling. He's still throwing things in the skip. Okay, so the aim today is not to talk about everything in the orbit and all the nerves and the arteries and the veins and everything like that. The aim today is to talk about the bones of the orbit. So we've talked about the bones of the orbit and uh, the fissures and the major foramina. Um, anything I've missed? Bum, bum, bum. Oh yeah. What happens if I, so how good is this skull, do you think? If I pass my pipe cleaner down through that nasolacrimal duct, do you reckon it's just going to end because it's plastic, or do you reckon it's actually modelled and it's going to come out through the inferior um, nasal meatus, huh? What do you reckon, what do you reckon? Ah, oh, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. All right, um, what about this one? Oh, that one goes through. Let's try an orange pipe cleaner. Yeah, look, you can see that in there. So that's what I mean about the nasolacrimal duct opening in that, underneath that inferior nasal meatus in there. All right, it's in there. There you go. That's a high-quality skill, uh, the nasolacrimal duct there. Otherwise, that's it, that's the bones of the skull. Now, what happens with a blow to the face? Now, there are a number of interesting things that happen to the bones of the face in a number of different fractures, like different types of Lefort fracture. Um, but if we talk about blowout fractures, now a blow to the eye, now the, the bone around here is actually pretty tough. Um, and of course, we've got, as I said, the stuff inside the orbit is, is all packed together. We've got all the interesting things like the muscles and the nerves and the blood vessels and the eye itself and all that. But we've also got a load of fat in there. So this is a really, really packed space, which means that a blow to the orbit here, to the eye, can increase the pressure within the orbit. And that means that when we were looking at the paranasal sinuses, we saw that the maxillary sinus is in here and it fills most of the maxilla, so the bone here becomes very, very thin. And we saw the ethmoidal air cells medially which means that the bone there is also very, very thin. And then we see the frontal sinuses up here, which means there's a thinness up here as well. So these bones are not as thick and tough as you think they are. So a blow to the eye increases the pressure within the orbit, and then the thing that's gonna be fa gonna fail is the thing that's gonna be weakest. So I think most commonly, the, you get a fracture in the inferior 
wall, so in the floor of the orbit. So that's your blowout fracture. The, the, the impact happens, the pressure inside the orbit increases, and the thin bone of the maxilla down here fractures into the maxillary sinus. Now you're looking at a patient who's had this you're looking at your patient who's had this blow and it might not be immediately obvious that a blowout fracture has occurred because the bones around here are likely to remain intact. There's going to be a lot of swelling, a lot of bleeding and the eye's going to be looking a bit weird anyway. But what you might see is that the eye might be pulled back a little bit into the orbit to so maybe a little bit sunken or it might take a day or two to notice that as the swelling goes down. So that's a blowout fracture, or one example of a blowout fracture. Obviously, if we're considering all of the surfaces of the, the bony orbit, then you could get a blowout fracture in the roof, in the floor, in the lateral wall, or in the medial wall. So a superior blowout fracture might occur into the frontal sinus. Well, that's less common. Now the lateral wall is actually very, very thick. We've got the, zyg the zygomatic bone here. So the lateral wall is less likely to, to get a blowout fracture um, because it's thicker than the others. So immediately a, a fracture will blow out into the ethmoid bone in here and into those ethmoidal air cells. So, the inf so the, a, a blowout fracture to the floor I think is most common and then medially is somewhat common and then a blowout fracture laterally or to the roof is, is much less common. Uh, and nowadays to the, the preferred method of assessing a blowout fracture is with, is with CT um, radiography. It tells you a lot more than an x-ray. I don't think people really use x-rays so much anymore. So there you go. The bones of the bony orbit and um, a, a hark back to the sinuses and what a blowout fracture is, how it's caused and where you should look. All right, hopefully that's a nice short one this week. Possibly not though. All right, see you next week.